Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it is. Number 72. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty. <clears throat> Father in heaven, how we love you. We lift your name in all the earth. May your kingdom be established in our praises. As your people declare your mighty works. Blessed be the Lord. And uh, we'll sing this before prayer. Keith, if you could order opening prayer for us. Number 71, as the deer. <clears throat> as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. Father, we thank you for being our God. As we just sung, Father, you are our desire. We love you because you first loved us. We ask that you be with this congregation as we continue this worship to you and the midweek study that we have. Please be with Paul as he's prepared a lesson. Help us to blot out the cares of the world and concentrate on your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> Number 76. Number 76, how great thou art. <clears throat> Let's sing verses 1, 3, and 4 before class. Verses 1, 3, and 4. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed.
Thou art. And when I think that God his Son not sparing sent him to die, I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my Shout of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, My God, how great thou art! Then sings my soul. And then invitation song will be number 939, 939. Good to see you this evening. Hope everyone's doing well. Sounds like we might have some more rain. That should be good. Well, last week uh, we talked about what to do for the next little while, and we decided that we would take a look at the book of Ephesians. So tonight uh, we'll begin that, and we'll look this evening the next few minutes at some introductory remarks and some background information uh, that might give us a little clearer perspective and point of view as we study through this this book over the next few weeks Aaron Rimmers uh, has written a great deal of material uh, a lot of background information and uh, a lot of summaries of many all books of the Bible and as well as some other materials and he makes this observation with regard to the city of Ephesus itself the capital of proconsular Asia uh, being about a mile from the sea coast was a great religious commercial and political center of Asia a uh, prominent city started back uh, before the, the Christian era began. It was noteworthy due to a variety of notable structures, among them the Temple of Diana or the Temple of Artemis. Uh, to the Romans it was Diana, which came to be known as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Pretty impressive, 342 feet long, 164 feet wide, made of shining marble. 56 uh, columns, 56 feet high. Took them over 200 years to build it. it. Made the center of influence of Diana worship. We read about that in the book of Acts in chapter 19 primarily. Um, 
where the Apostle Paul, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, <clears throat> is where he uh, talks about idol worship and idols that are made by hands are not really gods, and that stirred up some of the silversmiths and some of the others who made those idols. And, uh, because they were hurting their business greatly. And so when they hurt their business, they were hurting their pocketbook, and most people took exception to that and uh, tried to make an example of Paul. Next to Rome, Ephesus was the most important city that the Apostle Paul visited because of its commercial, political, geographical location, its uh, commerce. Uh, it's been called by some the third capital of Christianity since it was the center of, of work throughout Asia, especially the founding of the what we refer to as the seven churches of Asia Minor, which are uh, the Lord wrote to in the open, in chapters two and three in the book of Revelations. Uh, certainly the first capital of Christianity would be Jerusalem. The second would be Antioch because that's where all the mission efforts came out of, Antioch and Pisidia, and then the third here being Ephesus because of the role that it played uh, in this location in, in Asia and even out of there into Europe. Paul revisited uh, this place. Uh, he was there a number of times and returning from his second missionary journey, and we studied all this in, in great detail some few months ago in our, in our look at the, the life of the Apostle Paul and his travels and his works. And uh, he left on the second missionary journey, he left Aquila and Priscilla there in Ephesus uh, to take care of some of the things that had been started uh, to make sure that the work was going on. On the third missionary journey is when he stayed some three years in the city of Ephesus. Uh, during this second visit, uh, he had a great measure of influence, and so, so much so that it impeded the, uh, the worship of Diana and uh, the work of the artisans who were creating the idols uh, that uh, they put a lot of pressure on Paul and uh, were wanting to kill him, wanting to do him great harm. And so he fled from there and over into Macedonia. On his trip home following the end of the third missionary journey, he stopped at Miletus, a small town about 30 miles or so uh, from Ephesus. And there he called to him the elders of the churches in Ephesus to meet with them. And if you recall, uh, a very tearful, fond farewell uh, that was had by them as he encouraged of those men and reminded them of, of the great responsibility that rested upon their shoulders and, and their leading and work of, of the church, uh, knowing full well uh, that difficult days were coming. Uh, Paul warned them ahead of time uh, to be prepared and to be faithful and to be ready. But he spent a lot of time in Ephesus, probably more time there doing work than in any other single place or among the congregations that he established and worked with. But as we've already noticed, it was kind of the, the, the center of things in Asia. And, and from there, so much good was done. Uh, the gospel spread throughout, throughout the world uh, and great, great work. Well, let's look a little bit about the city. Uh, I'm going to show you three or four things here that, that were during the days of the Apostle Paul, days leading up to the first century and even beyond that for a little ways, uh, things that were at the very heart of, of the city of Ephesus. One of those was the amphitheater. It could hold up to about 25,000 people. And this was the venue for the riots against the Christians that are talked about and discussed in Acts chapter 19, where we find this. You know, my friends, that we receive a good income from this business. And you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that God made by human hands. 
are no gods at all. That was the speech that prompted the people to revolt against Paul, especially those who were losing out because of uh, so many people turning from idolatry to Christianity. And, and I mean, when you can have the real thing, why would you want a fake, you know? Uh, I mean, if somebody offered you a, a copy of Rembrandt's most famous painting, you'd say, oh, that'd be pretty cool. No one would know if it's a copy of the real thing. You'd think that'd be pretty, but then someone comes along and offers you the original. Which one do you want? Well, that's easy, isn't it? That's easy. I want the original. It has the greater value. It has the touch of the author on it. That's, the one I, that's what Paul was offering. That's what Silas and the others with him, that's what they were offering. And so when people saw that compared to the, to the, the fake idols that had been made by the hands of men, they were turning to Christianity. They were turning to Christianity. Here's that amphitheater. This is at one stage of some reconstruction of it. It has been used in recent years for various concerts that have been held there. Uh, pretty impressive place built into the side of the hill. Uh, this is it from the opposite view. Uh, and this is a little bit more restored and uh, in pretty decent shape, at least from a distance. That is not existed in the, um, the Western part of Turkey. This is in Turkey, modern day Turkey. Right. Yeah, yep. Yeah. yeah, so if you go visit Turkey, this is one thing you'd want to see. But if you go to Ephesus, you're going to be, Ephesus is really not any longer. Uh, I see there's people visiting, they still remember them. I'm sorry? Is remnant yes. of, of, of the past, you know, right. columns. And there, there's pieces. I'm going to show you a couple more pictures uh, of some other stuff. This is the most intact that's left. Uh, no one has lived in Ephesus, Ephesus since uh, when were the Ottomans in power, 15th century? 1400s, I think they were in power in the 14th, either 14 or 1500s. Uh, that was the last really, the last real time anybody of any number lived in Ephesus after, after the Ottomans had conquered it and found there was really nothing there that they could do or make use of. They just all moved away to so some other towns that are nearby uh, that are, are still there, but Ephesus is, uh, is no longer a city. That's, in, that's amazing considering what it once was. Yeah, it's, they still call it Ephesus. Yeah, they still call it Ephesus. And people go there. People, uh, people take... Uh, a, a, a lot of people go there to, because they, they want to walk where Paul walked. Right. And he was in Ephesus for a, a long time. And, and Ephesus, as we've already mentioned, was such, played such an important role in the spread of Christianity in the first century. So if you want to go see, uh, if you want to go see one of, the, one of the central places for Christianity in the first century, you're going to go to Ephesus. But while you're there, uh, I mean, you can travel to the, seven, to the other six churches of Asia Minor as well uh, that, that are all there as well as some of the churches that are not listed among the seven churches of Asia. There's other churches that we know that are in, in that area. Uh, Paul wrote to Colossae, for example. So, uh, but anyway, here's, uh, this is really qu quite an Im impressive uh, uh, structure. The fourth largest city of the Roman Empire during the first century, as we've already mentioned, a thriving commercial center was a home to the temple of the goddess Artemis, and that was Diana to the Romans. This is a, an artist's rendering of the temple of Artemis. 
uh, which was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Uh, we already give you the dimensions, 400 something feet long. I mean, it's a huge, huge facility, 56 foot tall beams. They were four feet around these columns, uh, huge. According to Pliny the Elder in his work, Natural History, the temple measured 425 feet in length, 225 feet wide, almost double the size of the fifth century Parthenon in Athens, had 127 columns that were 60 feet high and four feet in diameter. The columns were arranged in a double row on all four sides, eight or nine on the short sides, 20 or 21 on the long sides. These columns are the facades were decorated with relief figures from Greek mythology. Uh, that's written by Mark Cartwright from World History Encyclopedia. Um, some of the, the, the figures, uh, they were just all over them, carved on, on, the, on these columns uh, of characters, figures, animals, humans, plants, all various things from Greek mythology. Uh, there's not a lot of it left, there's just little pieces, but uh, pretty amazing. Artemis or Diana was the goddess of the hunt, chastity, childbirth, wild animals, and the wilderness. Also one of the most revered Greek deities, modern day excavations have revealed that three smaller Artemis temples preceded the Croesus temple. And the Croesus temple was the largest uh, until it had been destroyed. It was burned in 356 BC. And then the Ephesians rebuilt the temple even larger than the Croesus temple. Estimated where the, where the previous one was two times larger than the Parthenon, this one that was built by the Ephesians was estimated as being four times larger than the Parthenon and became known as one of the seven wonders of the world. This is what it looks like today. That's about all that's left of one of the most majestic and grandest constructions. <laughs> if you could walk away with some of those stones, you'd be a pretty good man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was pretty, uh, pretty amazing that the city was destroyed. The city was, Ephesus was, was engaged in a, a number of hostile takeovers over the years. And uh, as sometimes they, they came in, they, they just destroyed everything and then it was rebuilt and destroyed and rebuilt and uh, but after the Ephesians rebuilt uh, the Temple of Diana, and then it was destroyed, it was never rebuilt again. But you could see the challenge for uh, in a city that would establish. The only thing is that Christianity would be new to them and <coughs> would be a challenge to their society because of the fact that already establishing the song goddess belief, the goddess belief, and then um, all of the starting of something more strange. That's not anything new for Christianity. Remember where Christianity began in Jerusalem, and it was battling Judaism from this, from this very beginning. Uh, God followers who had been following the law of Moses for 1,500 years are now taught, you're going to turn away from that and turn to this. N nothing, nothing new in going to a place like Ephesus uh, to teach those who were practicing idolatry. Uh, maybe, maybe it was easier to teach them than it was to teach some of the Jews uh, who were already God followers. I, I don't know. I know a little bit later when we study the book of Colossians again here in a few weeks when we get to it, uh, 
the Apostle Paul will, will tell them that the gospel had been preached to every creature under heaven. So th there was a lot of receptivity in those days, even though, you know, you might think of a city like e Ephesus. Uh, th there were those who were opposed to it, as there are always people opposed to it. But there were those, and a lot of those, who were very, very receptive to the truth. Uh, many, many obeyed the gospel. Oh, yeah. So, you know, running into that was not anything new uh, for, for those proclaiming Christianity. Pardon me. Fourth largest city of the Roman Empire, some magnificent structures that, uh, that were built. One of those was called the Library of Celsus, uh, which is counted as one of the biggest libraries of ancient times. What is interesting about this building is it is not only a library, but a mausoleum as well, as it consists of the tomb of Gaius Julius Celsus Polymanus, who had been consul in 92 AD, and who was the governor of the province of Asia in 115. After his death, his son, consul Gaius Julius Aquila, had the library built in his father's honor, as we read from the inscription on the building's front staircase. The library was completed in 135 A.D., and Celsus's body was put in a white marble uh, sarcophagus. You want to know what that is? Huh? Uh, what did I say? <laughs> I didn't say sarcophagus. I think you said a sarcophagus. Maybe I did. Sarcophagus, I'm sorry. I know how to pronounce the word, I just... It's all right. <laughs> My one mistake for the day. I got all the way to seven o'clock. Uh, it is, uh, it's basically a, a coffin, usually hewn out of stone, and often will be set out where it would be seen, uh, but sometimes it was buried. It just depended on what uh, the family wanted to do. More like a what? A sepulcher? <laughs> a sarcophagus? Yeah, just put the emphasis on the wrong syllable. It's okay. Uh, no, I, that, that'd that be tough. But his was placed in a crypt beneath the building. Uh, and Here's the front facade to that library. Um, and here's another picture. It is one of the most photographed places in Turkey. And it is popular not only to take photographs of, but to be photographed in front of. Uh, and people who travel there, this is one of their, one of their photo ops. Uh, there's probably more of this standing than any other building left out of Ephesus. Uh, the stadium of Ephesus is located just to the south of the Badias Gymnasium in a depression near the Pion Hill. This was a place where celebrations of all kinds were held, including sports events, chariot races, and gladiatorial combats. It is thought because of these gladiatorial combats that when Constantinople declared Christianity as a religion of Rome, uh, that the stadium was demolished because there had been so many Christians who had been uh, killed there in, in fights with the gladiators. Uh, there are some reliefs that are carved out of uh, various items that still remain in, in, in Ephesus that show uh, combatants in, in gear, in their full gear, uh, shields and swords and, and ready to do great harm to someone not as well equipped as they were. Uh, some pretty, pretty impressive uh, sculpting uh, that was done in those places. This is the original gate uh, to the stadium. 
I believe this is on the south end of the stadium, uh, either the south or the north, one of the two, I can't remember offhand. And this is the stadium. Uh, there's not much of it left, but that uh, recessed area there, the, the low area, would have been the field where the games were held. And the chariot races would have been there uh, up in one end and, and a little bit smaller section and it'd be up to the end and the right uh, that would still have been in, in some of the, the hilly area. Uh, there was a, a smaller arena, which would have been where the, the gladiators would have fought. They would have had that whole open field. They would have been in a, in a smaller, more enclosed area, uh, an, an area cordoned off uh, where they could, they could have their, their combat. Uh, and out here, you'd have, you know, your javelin throwing, your arrow, bow and arrow contest and all that kind of stuff and, and races, chariot races, humans racing. Uh, up on the sides in the hills, there was originally seating there. Most of that, almost all of it, has been removed and used in other places in Ephesus to make some restorations. Uh, they could use original rocks that had been carved out, uh, had been all that was hand hewn, hand cut, uh, and, uh, and, and they've used that in, in other areas of restoring. The, the restoration uh, ha in Ephesus uh, has been going on for a little while, but to, the vast majority of it's been done since the 1990s. Uh, and and they, are, they are finding lots and lots and lots of stuff as they, as they unearth, as they go through here and, and, and dig in here, uh, there's no telling what they'll find. And in the areas around there, you know, skulls and bones and all kinds of artifact that will be left and, and uh, human remains and uh, so much other, so many other things will be found. This was a phenomenally important city. Uh, phenomenally important city that has gone away. Perry Lee writes in Orthodox Wiki, the question was asked, is there a church in Ephesus today? She said, or he said, no. Uh, but then there isn't anything in Ephesus today. The town was abandoned years ago. No one lives at that location. During the following centuries, the town prospered for a short time under the Turks, but was finally abandoned during the 15th century. Today, Ephesus consists of the remains of the Temple of Artemis, the theater, stadium, and a double church that probably is an old cathedral that was dedicated to the Virgin Mary where the councils of 431 and 449 were held. That's about all that's left. To a thriving city, a major seaport, major center of commerce, a major religious center. just left now to nature to work on it. This case 431, 449, Cathedral, is that considered Catholicism? Uh, that, yeah, the, uh, the term there, Cathedral, is a modern day term attached to the building. Uh, we don't, Okay, it's Catholicism in the 600. Right, right. It's, it's not a reference to Catholicism, uh, not to my knowledge at least. Uh, I, I'm not sure what the expression double church is unless it was used for two different things. Uh, that's a, I, I tried to find out what she was talking about uh, there. I, I can't determine what it was. Maybe someone could look it up if they want to do that. So just a little bit of history about this, about this city. Today it lies in ruins, modern day Turkey. Once considered the most important Greek city and the most important trading center in the Mediterranean region. Ephesus survived multiple attacks, changed hands lots of times between various conquerors. And here's the thing for us, it was a hotbed of early Christian evangelism and remains because of that an important archaeological site and Christian pilgrimage destination. Uh, they're going to find things. Uh, uh, will they find any scrolls? Yes. A double church is a church design found in 
Byzantine architecture. Um, it is a design that features double naves standing side by side and separated by a common wall. I didn't find out anything about that. That was, in her writing, that was the only thing that I saw. That was the only time I saw that. Uh, so I don't, I don't know. I don't know. And that may have been in that building. And that building may have been a later. It doesn't say. That building may have been a later structure as well. Uh, yeah, it, doesn't, it doesn't say that each side was used for something separate. It just says it has two names out front and it's separated by a common wall. I've got one here. It says uh, one side was used uh, for the Mother Mary and the other one was for John the Apostle. Mm -hmm. So it's just to build off of what. Yeah. Well, if you ever take a, shot, take a drive over to Ephesus, you can search that out, maybe. Do what? It might be part part of it. Part of it. I'm I'm confident that in the years to come, they'll they'll unearth some things there that. It's a tourist destination for sure. Yeah. 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 Well, if you ever want to go, if you ever want to go walk where the apostles walked, you're going to go to that part of the world. Uh, you want to go where the, where, where the church in its absolute infancy sprang into a large portion of the world. Uh, you're going to go to Jerusalem. Uh, you're going to go to Ephesus. Uh, you're going to go to Antioch. Those, those three areas of the world uh, are the very core of the spirit of the gospel. All right, let's take a little bit of a look at, at the book itself. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Paul identifies himself as the author of this book. Early sources in church history that attribute to this to Paul are include Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria, and Origen, as well as Polycarp, who in his book he wrote in 125 AD, which uh, certainly uh, is the closest of any of those to the apostle Paul himself, attests to uh, his canonicity and his own letter to the Philippians. Not, not very much debated as to Paul being the author of this book. There are, however, some reasons to believe that this letter was not designed for just one congregation, but intended to be passed around to several churches in the area surrounding Ephesus. The earliest manuscripts do not contain the phrase in Ephesus. Chapter 1, verse 1, Paul says, to the saints who are in Ephesus. The, the most ancient manuscripts do not contain that phrase in Ephesus. We'll look a little bit later and see how that probably came to be and, and, and why it's probably uh, is a later edition that certainly does no harm to the text. The epistle itself is in the form of a general treatise rather than a letter written to a specific church dealing with specific situations. For example, like Paul wrote to the church at Corinth to deal with a, a moral issue that had to be addressed as he wrote specifically to the Galatian Christians uh, to deal with, with, with the uh, uh, reintroduction of Judaism into, into their life. Uh, problems that had to be handled, not the case here in this letter at all. It is thought by some among those, Coney Bear and Housen, that this letter is the epistle that was first sent to Laodicea. And that's referenced in Colossians 4, 16. Now, when this epistle is read among you, what does the word epistle mean? We use that a lot. Letter. Letter. Now, when this epistle is read among you, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. Could it be that? Could be. Uh, 
We don't know for sure. If it is, that's perfectly fine. Um, we believe this information to be inspired as Paul identifies himself as the author and the Bible identifying to us that it was through these men that God pinned his, his will for our lives, instructions for the church. But it does appear, based on its construction and its design, uh, to be intended to be shared with other churches. Uh, that would include the Christians at Ephesus. So because Ephesus was the leading city of the region, the main center of Paul's missionary activity in the area, it is understandable by why later scribes might have assigned this epistle to the church at Ephesus. Without question, it was intended for the saints and the faithful in Christ Jesus, whether they were in Ephesus, Laodicea, someplace else. It's intended for the saints. It's intended for the church. It's intended for Christians. Paul first came to Ephesus uh, for a short visit near the end of his second missionary journey. Uh, Ephesus located on the southwest corner of our coast of Asia Minor, uh, one of the great cities in the world at that time. Uh, a Roman capital, wealthy, home to the goddess Diana. And uh, here Paul briefly studied with the Jews at the local synagogue. He was invited to stay a little bit longer and he made plans to visit with them after a quick return trip to Jerusalem at the end of that second journey. Then on his third journey, he did make it back to Ephesus where he stayed for some three years. And after this initial success in converting 12 disciples of John, he spent three months teaching in the local synagogue. Resistance to his teaching forced him to leave the synagogue, but he was able to continue in the school of Tyrannus for uh, about two years. And the end result is that the gospel spread from Ephesus throughout all of Asia Minor. And there was a disturbance created by some of the local idol makers that finally forced Paul to leave Ephesus. Remember that disturbance was taken in uh, to the theater and uh, the great speech was made that this man Paul says that gods that are made by the hands of men, they're not gods at all. And Paul was right. Uh, but those who made the idols were not happy with him. Toward the end of his third journey, Paul stopped at nearby Miletus, met with the elders, bid them a fond farewell, uh, encouraging them to the great work that lay before them. Reminding them of his work with them, he charged them to fulfill their own responsibilities as overseers of the flock of God, and did bid them a tearful farewell. <clears throat> Ephesus generally considered one of Paul's four prison letters, among the other are Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. General consensus is that during uh, his imprisonment at Rome, somewhere between 61 and 63, uh, this letter was written uh, to the church, to the Christians at Ephesus. The indication is that the epistles to Colossians, Philemon, and the Ephesians were carried to their destination by Tychicus and Onesimus, um, who were with the church in Colossae, and so dropped this letter off at Ephesus, and then took the letter to Colossians, as well as the letter to Philemon, since it is thought that Philemon was a member of the church at Colossae as well. So uh, having left Paul imprisoned in Rome, they delivered these letters that he had written. So why was it, why was it written? Well, unlike a lot of others, that are written to specific churches that we made note a while ago, this letter does not deal with any specific problems that the local congregation was having. That's a good thing, isn't it? It's a good thing. A little bit later, the church of Ephesus is gonna receive a scathing letter from, from the Lord, though. He's gonna charge them with having left their first love. They were doing some good things, but boy, they just turned away from their first love for the Lord. But here, things are good at this point in time. He addressed great themes that pertain to the Christian's position in Christ as a member of the body of Christ, as a member 
as a member of the Church of Christ, his, his body, his people. Paul has a beautiful prayer uh, for the recipients of this letter. And uh, as he expressed in that prayer, it was his desire that, that they would know a number of things. And among those, they would know the hope of God's calling. That they would know what are the glorious riches of God's inheritance in the saints. And that they would know what is God's great power toward those who believe. He prayed for those things, for those Christians. What a marvelous prayer. What a wonderful hope for those people. In the first three chapters, Paul works to answer his own prayer by explaining to them uh, the spiritual blessings that are in Christ, the heavenly blessings that are ours in Christ. The last three chapters focus on the conduct of the Christian, that is, to walk worthy of the calling with which we've been called. So if you break this down, just a couple of things, the first three chapters remind Christians of all the spiritual blessings that are ours in Christ. The closing three chapters encourage each of us as Christians to walk worthy of the calling by which we've been called in Christ, to live those lives that are being lived in harmony with the will of God. A grand epistle like Ephesians almost defies coming up with one main theme. Certainly with this exalted view of God's plan of redemption, we could certainly suggest the, the church, the fullness of Christ, as being the theme of the book, and that would be most appropriate. But another theme, one that was suggested by Warren Wearsby in his writing on the book of Ephesians says, he suggests the believer's riches in Christ. And with regard to Paul's prayer for the Christians in the first three chapters and, and the answering of that prayer, in essence, to, to their hope and for the fact that all of our spiritual blessings, all of our heavenly blessings are in Christ, then certainly the believer's riches are in Christ. And that will work for a good theme for this book. But if you wanted to look at the church, the fullness of Christ, that's a beautiful theme because the book of Ephesians deals with the church, deals with a discussion of the church, the beauty of the church, the bride of Christ, uh, and, and all of its splendor, where, where Colossians will have an, in, an emphasis upon the superiority of Christ and the beauty of Christ and the glory of Christ. Ephesians has the, the glory of the church and the beauty of the church, who is the, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, over which he reigns as head and master. A key verse. It's hard to find a key verse in this book. There's, there's not hard to find a key key verse. Uh, you can find lots of them, but maybe to find a key verse is a little challenging, but let's at least begin with Ephesians 1-3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And that's kind of where we'll start next week, Lord willing, as we open up chapter 1. I hope that uh, a little look at the history of this city, uh, as brief as it was, a little look at uh, the place and the work and the role of, of the church in Ephesus in, in the first century uh, will help us to keep in mind uh, what Paul would have them know as he wrote this letter to them originally and, and what he would have us to know as we look at this letter 2,000 years later, as we occupy our place in the church 2,000 years later, as we enjoy all of the spiritual blessings and the heavenly places that are ours today in Christ, just as they were for those Christians in Ephesus 2,000 years ago, they are ours today in Christ. What a blessing and what a thought. And that's kind of where we'll start next week. But that's next week, if God decides to give us that week. If he does, that'll be good. We'll be ready to be here and study together. But if not, are we ready for the bigger day, the greater day? Are we walking with him? Are we living with him? Are we anticipating 
looking forward to that time to be with him forever. Having obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, being baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins, walking with him faithfully, we know that reward will be ours. But what if we stumble? What if we fall along the way? Now what have we got to do? We got to repent, don't we? We got to ask God to forgive us of those things that we've done contrary to his will. And out of a broken heart and a contrite heart, return to the Lord, seek his forgiveness and his healing, and move forward and move ahead. If tonight you need some help moving ahead, well, we're here to help as we stand and sing. Oh, do not let the word depart. And close thine eyes against the light. For sin your heart and not your heart. Be saved all tonight. Oh, why not tonight? Oh, why not tonight? Thank you again for being here. Certainly it's good to see you. Hope your week has been going well. And we'll pray God's continued blessings upon us. We'll to let you know that uh, the funeral for Julian will be Friday morning at 11 o'clock. That'll be here in the auditorium. And following that, there'll be a catered luncheon in the fellowship room uh, that you're invited to stay and be a part of. 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock Friday morning. Yeah. Uh, talked with Ron and his family today. They were traveling down today. Uh, supposed to be here. So they should have been here this afternoon early. So they had a safe trip. Anyone know of anything else that we need to mention? Uh, Two arteries were completely blocked. He had four stents put in, still recovering in the ICU. Mm -hmm. But she said he's doing a lot better today. Good, good. Jen's friend, Laura's dad. All right. Back to school luncheon? Back to school luncheon, yes. Thank you. That'll be Sunday, following the uh, morning worship. <clears throat> and uh, if you want to make a contribution to Zach's money tree, uh, please feel free to do that. Uh, I'll collect those funds if you have them. If you don't have them on Sunday morning, that'd be okay. We still get them on the tree or some way. I'm sure he'd take them anyway we give them to him. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, but anyway, that'll uh, take care of that. And that'll be right after our morning service on Sunday. Yeah. That'll be... Uh, uh, pizza will be provided. If you want to bring side dishes, uh, things to go with pizza, salads, desserts, uh, those kinds of things, uh, that would be that would be welcome. Especially salads, especially salads. Uh, so anyway. Does it, does it, Joe, have the room already for that? Do you need some help making changes over? Uh, I just texted her because she was had a doctor appointment. So uh, yeah, she wanted to know what the 
scoop on it was. So I think what she's going to do is put a plastic table cloth over each table. Of course, remove the centerpiece first. Right. Uh, put those away. Uh, the banner she's got, she can either take it down or put something over it. It shouldn't be that. That can help you out. Need some help. She can text us. You can come and help too. Because mom was already saying something about that. So. Okay. Yeah. We need a little bit of help this evening, uh, getting the table back over here in this room uh, for Friday morning. Hmm? All the teachers are back at work. Yep. Uh, all the excitement of that. So uh, a week from today, the kids go back to school. So. It's hard to believe summer's over. No one flown right by. Anything else we could mention? All righty. We'll have a song in uh, number 97. And after that, Keith, can we get you to lead our closing practice? Number 97, I sing praises. I sing praises to your name, O oh Lord. Praises to your name, O oh Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. I sing praises to your name, O oh Lord, praises to your name, O oh Lord, for your name is great. me please. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. Thank you we're able to study your word. We thank you that we divide these books up and learn as much as we can about each individual book and the history and, and try to apply it to our lives and we can spread it to other people so they learn more about you. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray for those that uh, are dealing with illnesses. We pray. Thank you for the, the lady that's getting better from a heart attack. Pray that you'll be with others that are dealing with uh, illnesses that they recover quickly and be able to get back to a good state of health. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray for those that are mourning over Julian's passing and pray that you'll be with the ones that will be traveling here for services and look over them and, and comfort them. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray for the others that are traveling, Russ and Carla and ones that are on the highways and, uh, and Tim and Sherry, that uh, they'll be able to get back here safely. And we thank you again for the opportunity to be here. We thank you for your son. We ask all these things in his name. Amen.